Welcome back. In our last video, we talked about the end of the Bronze Age and Greek culture. This video will be about the Archaic Age. Um, it's been referred to by many as the Age of Experiment, or the Age of Expansion, or a kind of Greek Renaissance. This goes on roughly from 750 to 500 BCE. None of these dates are absolute, as they've all been assigned by scholars and aren't really marked by any one particular thing. The thing for, that you need to know about this is that during this period, the area that we would call Greek expanded greatly, and I'll talk about more about that in a second. And this is because um, the Greeks experienced an enormous population growth during this period, and as a result, had to send out colonies to occupy new lands to relieve uh, population problems back home. So suddenly, Greece goes from being a tiny map I showed you earlier, which more or less represents modern-day Greece, to being uh, a much greater area. Anywhere where Greek was spoken during this period is referred to as Hellas. And indeed, Hellas is the, is the name that modern Greeks call their own country. The archaeological record from this period has a good deal to say. We go from Greece really only occupying this smallish area right here to the Greeks colonizing areas up into what is now northern Greece and later spreading out all the way around the Black Sea, all through southern Turkey into Cyprus, into North Africa, into Libya, Egypt, Sardinia, Corsica, Sicily, southern Italy. This part of southern Italy is, gets referred to as Greater Greece uh, by the Italians who lived there. Uh, Greeks came to occupy Marseille in southern France, or what is now southern France, and as far away as Spain here. So you can see that Greek is being spoken from Spain to the northern Black Sea, and that's a, a, long, that's a long stretch of space. And the Greeks came to have an identity as, as Greek speakers because anywhere Greek was spoken was Greek in some way. Our archaeological record for this period also shows that the Greeks had an enormous population explosion, um, as much as sevenfold population growth in just a few generations. And uh, our record shows an enormous growth in the number of votive objects and building in stone. In other words, they can afford to buy durable goods that are made out of things that will last for generations, as well as build temples that look like this. Uh, one such was found, is found in a temple in southern Italy in a place called Paestum. This is a later example of a Greek theater. This one's built much later at Segesta, but still it signs of Greek activity in Sicily, a place we think of now as Italian. Uh, here is another theater in Paestum, Italy. So what happens during the Archaic Age? Greeks spread out. They make colonies. The colonies are themselves allied to their home cities in culture, but not necessarily uh, in terms of their governance. So if Sparta sent out a colony, that colony did not necessarily owe it allegiance. There it is. I just said Sparta. And that's a thing to talk about. From now on, we're going to be talking about city-states as political entities. In the Bronze Age and in the early Archaic Age, we have what are we have the oikos, is the single most important economic and political entity. We see a movement towards a polis, and that is a city-state, where a household or a group of households are less important, and the city itself is the thing that's important. We'll see a movement from the basileos to the aristoi, ruling things. And finally, we'll see a movement towards the oligarchy ruling things before we get to classical Athens where we have democracy. But back to the polis. The polis is a city-state. It's the single most important economic and governmental unit during this period. We also see a rise in a field of inquiry known as philosophia. And in Greek, this just means love of knowledge. Uh, but the thing about philosophia is this. It doesn't just mean philosophy in English. When we think of philosophy, we think of uh, men discussing being and time, or people discussing ethics. Philosophia also includes uh, fields of natural science. And the example I would like to use for this is a guy by the name of Thales of Miletus, who lived from 624 to 546 BCE. He's a practitioner of philosophia who actually predicted a solar eclipse in 585 BCE using math. The interesting thing about this is not that he predicted a solar eclipse. People have predicted solar eclipses before um, using math. The interesting thing about philosophia is that Thales and Miletus did not attribute the occurrence of the solar eclipse to any divine event. Instead, he knew that it was a, an act of nature, and it was nature uh, causing the sun to go dark at that time. 
and this is something that could be predicted by humans. Um, there's something interesting, too, about the nature of the Greek mind. It's evident in their language, and it's this phrase that I have written here, at number four, tomen tode, and it just means on the one hand, on the other. And there's this way that the Greeks have of categorizing things into groups that's encoded in their language. On the one hand, on the other. There's this and there's that. And this is very useful for people who are cataloging natural phenomena or doing work in what we would call natural science or working in philosophy. Things are either one way or the other. And this often leads to kind of binary approaches to things, the good and the bad, the right and the wrong. But it's a start, it's a movement towards more systematic thinking. Greeks who were practicing philosophy were interested in logos, a reason or explanation for why things were happening outside of that which was supernatural. And they were exploring their cosmos. They were looking up at the stars. They were exploring the way plants grew and the way optics worked. Another social turn that happened during this period was an advancement in technology in the form of hoplite armor. Hoplite armor was different from the armor the Greeks had used before, which was made out of leather and bone and bits of bronze attached. Hoplite armor was made mainly of solid pieces of bronze uh, or other metal that were stitched together in some way to form armor that people could afford. Now when I say it was affordable, I mean it was still quite expensive and it was an heirloom kind of item. But if you could afford hoplite armor during this period, you could fight in your city's army. You could fight in your polis's army. Now, what does this mean for us? Well, let's look at the armor first. Here's a hoplite helmet of the Corinthian type, and we see that it, it leaves openings for the eyes, and it covers much of the face, exposing only really the mouth and the bottom of the nose. Uh, this is good armor, but uh, the Greeks would later move away from this, because people who were wearing this had a hard time hearing what was going on. Uh, here's a hoplite corslet, and that's a breastplate. It also covers the back. Uh, you can see that this is made out of one piece of metal here. It's been hammered into shape. And here's what the whole group looks like when it's put together. We have these greaves covering his legs. We have his arm covered up. We have a corslet, and we have a full Corinthian helmet. The centerpiece of this is this shield right here. Hoplite warriors would march in very, very close formation so that each soldier was covering the soldier to his left with his shield, creating an impenetrable shield wall. They also carried long spears um, called dories. These allowed them to fight an enemy from pretty far away without doing much hand-to-hand -hand combat until things went totally awry in battle. You can imagine this formation moving towards you at a double-time march would be pretty intimidating, almost like a giant human tank. And the idea wasn't so much to get into close hand-to-hand -hand combat as in Bronze Age fighting, so much as to mow your enemy down. Casualty rates for battles using hoplite, and hoplite armor and phalanx formations were actually pretty low. Uh, most battles were fairly short and ended with um, a treaty happening where one army submitted fully and the other army uh, took what it wanted from the village of a losing army and usually erecting some sort of trophy to said victory. There's something inherently very warlike about the Greeks during this period, as it seems that they like engaging in warfare for fun at times. Stay tuned for my next lecture on political developments during the Archaic Age and beginning of the Classical Era 